Welcome to Eddie Had Cargo Connections. I'm your host, Ron Anderson. And tonight I'm joined by trainer Chad Summers. How are we doing tonight, Chad? I'm doing very well, Ro. Good to hear, man. How is the weather over there? Well, we left uh, we left New York uh, last week and head down to South Florida. So the weather went from uh, cold to warm uh, <laughs> very quickly. So we can uh, we can't complain. It's uh, it's in the 60s and 70s, and it's uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, for sure. And so we'll just start at the beginning. Uh, where were you born, and where did you grow up? So born and raised in New York, uh, right outside New York City in Long Island, New York, and. Uh, it was uh it was very nice. Not a lot of horses involved, although we me and my my brother would go with my father to uh to Belmont Park uh for the big race days or they had a breakfast program called Breakfast at, at Belmont and we'd just go and watch the horses train on a on a Saturday morning once in a while and it just kinda got hooked from there. Yeah, and what was it specifically about horses and horse racing that got you passionate? Well, I was a midget. So when I was growing up I was really small. I was I, I was a freshman in high school. I was four foot ten and I weighed ninety pounds. And it was one of those things to where I thought I was gonna be a jockey. I was yeah. I was right I was riding. I spent my summers, you know, riding and, and learning and wanting to to be a jockey. And when I was tall enough to ride the roller coaster by the time I was a junior in high school, that dream had to go away. And uh, you know, but the horses were always something I was passionate about. I just I love kind of the puzzle of of watching horses get better and seeing you know, what they would do to improve and, you know, being on their back was something that was kind of surreal. And, you know, once you start kind of working with horses and, and watching races, if you're passionate about it, it's something that just kind of takes over. I mean, you can watch any other sport, but it doesn't have that same thing like a horse race does, you know, for the two minutes or a minute and a half that the race is going on. I mean, from start to finish, you're you're all in. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And we'll just um we'll talk about you know um when you when you when was it you decided to become a horse trainer and what were the biggest influences in doing so? Yeah, so I never really thought I was going to be a, a trainer. Actually, when I got too tall to be a jockey, I, I wanted to be a writer, and I, I did that. I worked for a lot of uh, publications. I had a a radio show. Worked for a couple of tracks. I was a a clocker. I was a bloodstock agent. I uh, did a little bit of everything. And along the way, as an owner. Um, I just kind of was getting kind of hands on and getting very involved and it got to a point of just trust. And, you know, sometimes I had some trainers that just weren't very uh, upfront and truthful for whatever reason, I don't know. And, and so just eventually you're just like, all right, I guess we'll just do it ourselves. And, yeah. uh, and that's where we, that's, that's, that's kind of the path we went down. And um, I started, I had four horses and the first race I ever won was, uh, was in Dubai. We won the golden Shaheen and, when we came back from Dubai back to America within about a month, I went from four horses to 60, which is not the way you're supposed to do it. Uh, to anybody out there that uh, that wants to be a trainer or anything like that, I, I would say grow gradually. Don't don't go from zero to 60. It's it's not good for a car and it's not good for a, for a career. Uh, so I made kind of a lot of mistakes along the way, you know, growing as quickly as you as you grow. And, you know, influences. Look, I'm, I'm a New York guy. So I grew up idolizing, you know, the Nick Zitos and Alan Jerkins and the son Jimmy Jerkins of the world. And, um, you know, it's really been it's been great. Both both locally and internationally, as my career has grown, you know, not only befriending some of these people that I that I looked up to uh, for so long as a kid, but, you know, internationally, when we travel and we get to go to some of these other countries, uh, the acceptance of the other trainers and, and going into their yards and then know showing us how they do things and look everybody does things differently and there's not a a right or wrong answer and uh it's really great to just learn and 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 see how people do things differently and that's yeah really really cool story like did you focus when you wrote did you do specifically horse racing or other sports as well well <laughs> when you grow up in long island we don't we don't have a jockey school here or anything yeah. like that so yeah. uh i wanted to go fast and the place I was at was more of a proper like uh, jumping and dressage place. And they want you to, you know, complete a course and, and do jumps. And I didn't want to jump. I just wanted to go fast. So there was some uh, some conflict of interest with my riding instructors along the uh, along the way. But uh, it was uh, it was interesting for sure. That's the, to say the least. And w were you a journalist? You you write for publications? Yeah. You said, yeah. And yeah. Just yeah I, work for, riding? I work for the. Yeah, I wrote. I worked for the Thoroughbred Times and now the Font uh, Magazine for a while. 
Uh, I worked for the Associated Press. I worked for um, local ABC affiliate in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I worked for a company called The Greatest Game, uh, Horse Racing Radio Network, uh, a little bit of everything. So That's we were really cool. uh, we were very, very active. Yeah. That was really cool. Yeah. And we'll just, you mentioned it briefly a moment ago. We'll just talk about um, how gravy life really is um, with Mind Your Biscuits, uh, you know. Um, I ran on the website. I've seen the races. Insane. Like you said, you know, went from <laughs> zero to a thousand, um, headed out to Dubai for that group one, took it out and then went back and did it again the following year. What was that entire experience like? We'll start with just how Mind Your Biscuits came to you. I know you were a part owner in him. Is that correct? Yeah. So, yeah. so basically me, my dad and my brother, we had kind of dabbled a little bit with some cheaper horses and, yeah. um, we just always, we, we, we love the game, but we're an apartment. My dad was an electrical contractor. So it wasn't, yeah. you know, you don't go electrical contractor, big horse owner. Normally that's yeah. not the, uh, the route yeah. it goes. Yeah. So uh, we wanted a pin hook. We wanted to try pin hooking. It seemed like it was fun. And uh, in America, you know, pin hooking is, is really big part of the game, whether you're going weanlings to yearlings or yearlings to two-year-olds. Um, you know, it seems like it, you can't really get hurt. And you can make a lot of money. Uh, of course, that's in principle. It doesn't ever work out like that. But uh, that's what goes through your mind at the time. So I saw this horse at the sale, at the yearling sale, and he was all head and no body. Like he had to grow into his body, but he had a walk that was beautiful. And he was in a tent barn at the time that uh, he barn where you couldn't really see like his full walk. You'd see like three or four steps, turn around. So it wasn't really great. So we're in the back ring for the night of the sale. It was a New York bread sale. And all of a sudden in the back ring, he had kind of more landscape to walk with us. And man, I said, he's got a, a gorgeous walk. But at that point, you know, we hadn't vetted him out. We didn't know what we were going to do. So we just watched. And thankfully, he didn't sell. He r and for 47000 Um, mm -hmm. So I got together with my dad and my brother quickly. And, and this girl, Susan Montaigne, who was going to break the horses for us. And we decided to partner with the, the original people that had the horse. And we bought we bought half of them on a valuation of thirty thousand dollars, and mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of where the story begins. And I mean, it's a it's a crazy crazy story with a lot of roller coasters. And mm -hmm. from the time I started watching them gallop, just kind of fell in love with them. And it, he they had been there for about a month, and I said, oh, you know, what if we don't take this horse to the sale? I said, can we buy him from you guys? Like, what what do you guys want to buy you out? And again, we it was a thirty thousand valuation. They go uh 150,000 I go well that's ludicrous like no yeah. like yeah so uh so we went on I loved watching this horse train he was doing really good and we went to the sale and the week before the sale they have well week before the the breeze they have like a prep breeze and that's kind of you're going to go two fists slower than you normally go you're not all out but you're getting a feel of the track and and all that kind of stuff and he saw a horse in front of him and he prep breezed in 10 flat you're like, man, he's going to set a track record when he when he works on the day and he'll sell for all this money. And I still didn't really want to sell him, but I love the horse. And, uh, you know, we see what happened. So the day he was getting ready to breeze happened to be really, really hot day. His number was called. He was in the fifth set, which was like two o'clock in the afternoon. And it was like 85 degrees outside. And when the weather gets warmer, that track starts to kind of get more cuffy and warm up because it's a tapita track. It's a poly track. And uh, for that reason, he worked 10 and three instead of 10 flat. And every fifth of a second here, I know in other places like Australia and Europe, when they have those breeze up sales, time's not really that big of a factor. But in America, where we love speed, every fifth of a second is a big deal. So 10 and three, even though he looked pretty doing it, nobody really liked him too much. And it was a 1200 horse sale. He was hip like 1176 or something like that. Most people had already bought horses and gone home. And so he went to the ring, and again, he didn't sell. Nobody wanted him. So he r and for $47,000. And I said, look, I said, let's just take him to the races. And they're like, ah, we'll see. Let's see what we want to do. And I'm driving to the airport the next day, and the girl called me, Susan, and she said, well, this guy came and, and looked at the horse. He wants to give us 30000 I think we should take it. And I said, if you want to take 30000 that's fine, but I'm going to be the one giving you guys the rest. Of and from there, we had, uh, we had a racehorse. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of uh, – he showed he showed a lot of ability. He was a uh, he was a giant pain um, in the stall and walking. He had a, a personality of his own, and he was very very difficult. And uh, he ran second first time out, and second second time out, and third in a two hundred fifty thousand dollars stake race.
but took a little while for the light bulb to really click. And, you know, the debut of his three-year-old year took him up to New York again, and he won by like eight lengths. Uh, and there you saw kind of the ability was starting to come out. He was starting to kind of figure out the game. And as the year went on, he ended up being a group one winner. He won the Malibu in December. And from that point, um, they had been talking to us a little bit about going international. I never had a passport before. I didn't even know, like, I thought you get your passport. Like, you know, you go to, uh, go to the store, you get it and it's yours the next day. I didn't know you had to send away for it and take uh, photos and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, we just said, you know what, let's, let's try it. Let's, let's go for it. And, and we went, and I remember the first time going there, I had finally taken out my license before um, we had run it in Roderick Rodriguez and, and Robert Falcone. And I was just kind of still kind of with them kind of side by side. And then eventually uh, some of the partners wanted me to take out my license. So I took out my license. And when we went to Dubai, I, I think I had talked to every American jockey, trainer, groom, everybody who had been there before because had no idea what to expect. I mean, it's one thing if you're traveling and you're going from, you know, one track to another, a couple of hundred miles away, this is thousands and thousands and hours and hours and so many different time zones away. Um, and just kind of pick their brains on, on everything and got such really good advice. Um, I don't think I left the horses stall for the, the 10 days we were there and we were able to win. And, and that victory I mean, it's one I'll never forget as as long as I live. And it was it's very, very special. And so that place, you know, Dubai is always going to hold a, a special place in my heart. And to go back the next year was really, really cool because we were off a little bit of a losing streak. We had lost three or four races in a row. And I knew why we had lost and we had run well. We hit the board and, you know, the Breeders' Cup and, you know, big races. But we hadn't crossed the wire first. And that second, that second one in Dubai – I mean, the race was so deep. You had horse and XY Jet who would run second in the race a few years earlier and then would go on to win it the next year. Roy H was coming off a win in the Breeders' Cup. Um, just a deep, deep field. Jordan Sport was coming off a track record. Um, so it was just a really, really, really cool thing. And uh, we were able to 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 win. And, and that, that second victory, I mean, if you ever watch a replay of a race, I, I don't think you we ever thought we were really a winner. Uh, it, until maybe we got to the wire, until at least the number flashed. I mean, we were so far behind. And X Y Jet's a really nice horse, and um, just kept, just kept running and kept running and kept. You know, Biscuits was a horse that just he loved what he did, and he loved to compete. And as long as there was a target in front of him, he'd try and go get him, and and that's what he did. And we were able to get up at the wire and and win back to back years in Dubai, which was, I mean, so special. And just. You, you mentioned it as well, you know, in terms of getting your license. Is it is it correct in saying that the Golden she had in, in 2017 was your first career victory? As yeah, a yeah, I had a, I had four starts before that. I had a, I ran my first horse in like a cheap claimer race. We were finished fourth, and then I ran Biscuits in the prep for, the prep to go to Dubai, and he ran second. He was about 85 percent cranked up that day, and uh, he ran second. Got beat a nose. Uh, and then I ran a third horse named Cassie Gordo in New York, and he ran second, got beat a nose. And it's funny, actually, uh, the jock that rode him on that day, a guy named Rajiv Mirage, uh, he always likes to joke with me. He goes, you know, I, I made sure we got beat in the, the race in New York because it's a better story if you win first time out in a $2 million race than just winning a maiden race at Aqueduct in the middle of the wintertime. So, yeah, uh, yeah just the way it worked out, it, it was my uh, my first career victory. And as they say, it's uh, it's all downhill from there. Yeah, they, they say that, but I, I highly doubt <laughs> that's the story. I mean, third place finish in Breeders' Cup. Um, I've watched, you know, um, interviews with yourself, um, things you've said, such as, you know, he did it super easy. He knows when to get down to business. Um, you said it a moment ago, you know, he sees a horse in front of him. He, he All he knows is to do is to chase. Um, who, who have been some other horses, you know, that have stood out since you've taken out your trainer's license and, you know, in terms of highlights for your career so far? Well, I mean, it's it's really been kind of a, a convolute of a lot of things because while I train, I also still do a lot of buying and selling and stuff like that. So i um, been really blessed the last couple of years working with uh, Gold Square Stables. Uh, we had horses like uh, Cyberknife that was second in the Breeders' Cup, uh, just recently retired and went to stud uh, this year on the Derby Trail with uh, Instant Coffee and Slip Mahoney. Um, I had a filly name off the tracks 
uh, that won the group one mother goose. Uh, she was really, really special. She was the same year as, as biscuits. And I mean, she was the, um, just an unbelievable horse. Um, so she was really special. We had a filly named truth hurts that we bought for 30,000 and, you know, she earned three fifty. ran against Gamine and some of those, uh, those monsters in the, uh, in the Philly division. And, you know, it's, it's been kind of a, a, a trial of, of a lot of different things, but we've had a lot of success more so on the bloodstock stuff on the training side. Um, most of the horses I get are the inexpensive variety. So uh, to have them win stake races sometimes is a little bit uh, tougher than, uh, than the other ones. <laughs> And and just quickly, because this I've been talking about this with my editor and everyone else. Biscuit's name, where did that come from? So when I was driving to the airport and the girl Susan had called me and she said, Oh, okay, you know, we're gonna buy sell the horse, whatever. I I'm listening to country music, just driving to oh, the airport, sorry. and the song true. came on. Yeah, okay. And cool. the song the song comes on from Casey Musgrave, so yeah. I didn't even know who she was at the yeah. time. And the song is Mind Your Own Biscuits and yeah. Life Will Be Gravy. Yeah. And I mean, I laughed so hard at the at the lyrics that I started crying. Yeah. And I called my brother right away and I said, listen, I said, we got to name this horse, you know, Minor yeah. Biscuits. And he goes, oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Let's go for it. And then yeah. as time went on, we didn't do it because you got to pay $100. And, yeah. Yeah. So we're like waiting the, the whole time. The horse was just unnamed, unnamed until like maybe two weeks before he ran. Yeah. And uh, and finally, like, all right, we've got to come up with a name. And my brother goes, just go for it. Just let's name him Minor Biscuits. And yeah. And we did. And as the horse got good, he actually started to uh, to message uh, Casey Musgraves every time he ran on on Twitter. He'd say, "Hey, Casey, your horse is running." And she never wrote back or anything like that. He bought a he bought a Mind Your Biscuits uh, shirt that was like bedazzled and everything. And that was uh, he'd wear it underneath his suit every time the horse ran. It was uh, it was a good time. And look, the name actually had a really really popular following, so it was it was pretty cool. That is really cool. And how many horses do you have in the stable at the moment? 12. 12. Awesome. And you now prepare, you now prepare Morass, um, who you received from, did you receive him from Al Murray, uh in October last year after winning the Al Shandaga Sprint? Just so, so this is a, this is a, a, a pretty cool story. Yeah. So I was in Dubai for a world cup last year. Yeah. And I had, I had seen a YouTube video. I've been watching, I always watch the carnivals. You know, if you're a racing fan, to watch the carnival in Dubai at that time every Thursday, now it's Friday. I mean, you see, I mean, there's seven, eight races, and they're great races. I mean, every every week you see some some nice horses. And I watched one last Sunday, and I, I saw a YouTube uh, piece that Laura King, my friend Laura King, had done um, with the owner, uh, Maithal Sawadi, who I think 23, 24 years old, you know, young, young owner. Um, and it was, it was great. And I just, I met her when I was in Dubai and I said, look, I said, if you ever come to America, you know, I'd love to you know show you guys around or do you need a place to stable or whatever, if you come for a big race. And she said, thank you. And, uh, as the week went on, I went on, uh, on Laura's TV show. I was on Arabic TV show and, uh, I was picking Maras. I thought he was going to win the race. Like it, it just, he caught my eye in the morning time and he was a cool horse and he ended up getting scratched the morning of the race. And so I got a call at midnight after the world cup. And, and my then her father said, um, we must see you. So I said, okay. So they came to the hotel. My flight was like two 30 the next morning, leaving to go back to the States. And they said, we want to give you Maras to train. And I'm like, okay, no problem. Didn't know why he was scratched, what was wrong with him or anything like that. And, uh, we brought him to the States probably in April, um, gave him about six, seven weeks off on the farm, uh, over at Paragon farm for Britain Nakatani and, uh, just let him kind of get over some of his little ailments and, and just be a horse. And uh, we brought him up to Belmont and then he's kind of been with us ever since then. So he's been with us probably since the, uh, the middle of May and the May. And uh, it was just kind of a process and, and getting to know him and uh, he trained, he trained great. And then the first time we were going to breeze him, uh, I called the, the jock that rode him in Dubai, a guy named Antonio Perez, who was a good friend of mine. I said, oh, we're getting ready to breeze that horse. He said, whatever you do, don't hit him with the crop. Don't smooch him. Don't do anything. Just sit. I said, okay. So the first time we breezed, he hadn't done anything in six months. We figured he'll go an easy, you know, go an easy 600 meters in 38, 39. And he went 35. Mm. And uh, we're like, well, that was, that's interesting. Then he goes 800 meters and he goes 46. He goes, oh, <laughs> this horse might be pretty fast. Yeah. And uh, and sure enough, we got him to the races and he ran really good. He was a work short, um, but we wanted to kind of get his year started, see if we can make the Breeders' Cup. And he ended up running third. 
uh, got a little tired late, but he's beaten four lengths by elite power who came back and would go on to win the, the Breeders' Cup last year. So certainly, you know, really good form. When we ran back next time out in the Bold Ruler, we were drawn inside with post one, and uh, another jockey was drawn outside of us, and he decided that we were the speed of the race. He was going to try and take us out. So he kind of tomahawked us into the rail. We bumped the rail twice, and that whole race was just a total throwaway. Hmm. And, uh, you know, again, our, our plan all along has been to target these big races in the Middle East, you know, whether it be Saudi or Dubai. And so when we, we sat there, we tried to get into the carnival, and we weren't accepted into the carnival for whatever reason in Dubai. So we said, well, let's point to this race in Saudi Arabia. We called, and we, we found out our rating was – was 111 at the time. We said, okay. So, you know, with the, the things that we've done in Dubai in the past is you want to get there with a fresh horse. So it was either running in a stake race or running an allowance race. And we chose kind of the, the road less traveled. We went to the allowance race, a little bit of a smaller purse, but an easier field and kind of get his confidence going. And mm -hmm. he was, I mean, just absolute dominant. Couldn't draw up a better race than he ran on December 30th. And for a while, we didn't know if we were going to get in or what the situation was going to be in Saudi finally we got in and uh and it's been all systems go since then but i mean just a really really cool horse and you mentioned you know his where he's what his program looks like going ahead you talk, have him targeted for the dirt sprint riyadh before a tilt at capturing which is insane your third golden shaheen during the carnival what are your thoughts on these races and as you said you know um how he's running you know on the dirt and how he's performing in his you know performances um, how how's it looking and how would those races suit him specifically? Well, I mean, look, the, the thing is when you have a sprinter here in the States I, I don't, and even internationally, I know obviously that you have the Everest over there yeah. in Australia that I tried to go to uh, year one, but I uh, didn't have the right horse for it. But, uh, you know, the thing is those sprint, the sprinters don't run for a lot of money. Sometimes there's, there's good races and there's group ones, but the purses aren't necessarily, you know, seven figures. Yeah. So, if you have a fast horse, you know, other than the Breeders' Cup, this is where you want to go. You want to you want to go on that 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 Middle Eastern circuit where the the Riyadh race is one point five million, the Dubai race is two million, and and you have a chance to run for major prize money. And look, you know you're going to have the best horses in the world. I mean, specifically when you go to Saudi Arabia, we know I think the field's going to be Elite Power, who won the Breeders' Cup. Gunite, who's a multiple grade one uh, winner, that's a son of gun runner for Steve Aspison, who's getting ready to win his 10,000th career race. <laughs> then you have four top horses from Japan, including last year's uh, Gate to Wire winner in, uh, in Dancing Prince. And then you have five horses coming over from, from Dubai, uh, including Tuz, who was very impressive last weekend, winning the, the same race that uh, we won last year. <laughs> and and Switzerland, who won the Golden Sheen last year. Yeah. So. I mean, it's it's about as deep a field of sprinters as you're going to see. It's a 14-horse yeah. field. And and the thing is, you know, post and sprint races is very important. Um, with Biscuits, we were drawn 14-1. and one. It didn't seem like it made a difference. With this horse, post will make a difference. Yeah. Um, he's he's brilliantly fast. Yeah. And he's going. There's no – we make no bones about what our strategy will be or anything like that. Um, he's the fastest horse I've ever trained. Uh, biscuits was different even though biscuits had the track record and and things like that he was a different kind of horse this horse i mean if i let him he'd go a half mile in 42 seconds like yeah. he's that kind of brilliant speed and so it's it's nerve-wracking because with biscuits he was this closer he was this dynamic closer where even if you didn't win right look as as a trainer we're always optimistic right even though we win maybe 10 percent of the time yeah. we think we're gonna win 80 percent of the time all, all of us, right? So, man, oh, we're, you're going to win. Your, yeah, yeah, yeah. My horse is ready. With Biscuits, we were always going to pick up a chance. Even if he didn't win, he was going to be right there. It's how he ended up making $4.3 million was he had seven wins in like 10 seconds. He was always always right there closing. With this horse, he's like an all or nothing. So so you're sitting there and you're preparing and you're getting ready to, to, to undergo this journey. And you hope you're going to win. But there's a chance you can make nothing. Like that's, that's how it goes. you right. You're, if you live and die by speed, you live and die by speed. And, and that's what this horse is. So, you know, we're hopeful that he, he's fresh and he's, and he's well prepared. Um, but it's a long stretch. It's a 500 meter stretch in Saudi. We know it. We've been there before. Um, when he turns for home, he's going to have to find a little more and then he's going to have to find a little more again. 
uh, to try and hold off some of these other horses. And you mentioned, you know, just in, in reference to the Everest as well, have, it's the importance of having the right horse. Are there any other horses in the stable that you would look to bring to Saudi or to the UAE? Well, I try. I tried. I tried to bring three horses to the carnival and uh, didn't get invited with all of them. And they were two of them were ranked high enough. One was a stakes place filly that they said wasn't ranked high enough, but we just didn't get invited. I uh, was very disappointed in that wanted to wanted to travel for the carnival. Uh, our friend Doug O'Neill's over there with uh, a handful of horses, and we're looking forward to the opportunity. But it just didn't come to fruition. So, um, you know, we had another horse, that instant coffee uh, that I was mentioning before for Gold Square that we talked about. You know, maybe running in Saudi and Dubai in the, in the three-year-old races, but he won. He won the Derby second in the points the Kentucky Derby. Uh, so we'll uh, we'll stick with the conventional route and try and make the Kentucky Derby with him. And who, who was for the Kentucky Kentucky Derby? Sorry, instant coffee. Instant coffee. Yeah, awesome. And just with Morass, just yeah. quickly as well, you've had um some you've had two you know two of the best jockeys going around at the moment with Flav the last start, and then before that for the previous three starts before that you had Antonio Frezu who's in the top three ranked in the Jockey Challenge sorry Jockey Championship ladder in Dubai at the moment. Who's being engaged for the race in Riyadh um, and the Golden Shaheen? So it, it looks like in Riyadh it's probably going to be a uh, kid named uh, Adorno. Okay. He, uh, he wrote him last time on December 30th. Yeah. And uh, Abner Adorno from Puerto Rico is a young kid. And the thought process behind that, he, he's gotten to know the horse. He's, he's breezed them in track work. In the, so yeah. Abner Adorno's gotten to, to know him in the morning time with track work. And he's going to go over there with a lot of confidence. Yeah. And... And that's what we're looking for. So um, it, it was it was it was a tough call between uh, Antonio and uh, and Abner, um, but you know it, it's it's one of those things where you know have a lot of confidence in both. Uh, Abner's just been been getting on him more recently, yeah. um, and a Antonio's agent made some some comments that you know I wasn't really too fond about. So yeah. uh, we're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna go with Abner. And Abner also, you know, got that win on him um, in, on the 30th of December as well, as as you mentioned, at Aquedar. Yeah, is, um, yeah. And look, he's, it's always handy. He's never, you know, he's never, that ride. He's, he's never been in, in this kind of a race before, yeah. but I feel yeah. like he's got nerves of steel. And I think mm -hmm. that's, look, it's going to mean a lot to him. He's never had this opportunity. And I want to I wanna give him that opportunity. I think mm -hmm. he, he deserves the opportunity. And it, it's funny because, you know, I've gotten some calls from some of the top American jockey agents here as well. Hey, you know, I'm riding this race. I'm over it, or I'm going yeah. to the Jockey Challenge. I'm there on Saturday, mm -hmm. and uh, look, it's it's just it, it's something that we we hold close to our heart. I'm a very loyal person, and we're just gonna stick with Abner for right now. Yeah, that's awesome. And just um, in your stable, uh, are there any stars or up and coming, you know, um, younger ones that we should keep an eye out, you know, in terms of having potential to be unleashed? Yeah, there's a there's a there's a horse that we we ran once. Um, last year, he had a little problem with the shin in the race. Uh, he finished behind Shadow Dragon, who came back and ran second in the Holy Bull on Saturday. A uh, horse named Thank You, John. Um, he's uh, a three-year-old now. He's one that, that we're, we're really excited about. And then we actually claimed one. I know you guys don't do a lot of claiming in Australia, but uh, we, we claimed the horse. He was in for a, a maiden claimer. He never won a race before. He was in for 25000 Uh And he won by 23 lengths and got a really – he got the fastest number of any three-year-old in the country. So uh, we're excited about him too. He's uh he's kind of a, an unknown variable at this point, you know. But if he can if he can back those races up, then maybe we got a good one in him as well. And if there were any races in the Middle East, um, you mentioned you know the Everest as well, um, or at home in America, um, that you would love to really compete. And as you said, you love going fast. And you always have had that drive to really compete and throw it down. Where would they be, and what which races specifically would you love to target? Well, the, look, we've come really close in the Breeders' Cup. We've come really close. Uh, we, I, I still feel like we should have won at least one of them so far. And and then even with my affiliation with Gold Square with Cyberknife, we, we got beat a nose on the wire in the Breeders' Cup mile last year. So uh, any Breeders' Cup race, uh, I would love to town. Uh, we've been trying. Uh, we really, really want to win that. You know, of course, you know, anyone from America will tell you the Kentucky Derby is, is something that is important. Um, I don't know that you know, look, that's that's a tough race. You have to have the best horse on that day. You know, I, uh, those races like the Breeders' Cup or the Dubai races and stuff like that, where it's kind of you have to earn your way into it and then you win. It just 
it hits a little bit differently for me because it's not, okay, you were best on this day. It was, you know what, you've had the career that the horse deserves the opportunity to run in those races, and you're running against the best of the best. In the Derby, it's a little bit of a battle of attrition. Who's left standing? It's almost like a like a Royal Rumble kind of thing. And, and really, you know, some of these other, you know, prestige big races, it's a matter of, you know, I deserve it. I, I've been pointing for this. And, you know, we love that. And, and look, we like we like traveling. We love we love traveling internationally. Um, you know, haven't gotten to places like Ascot yet or uh, Australia would love to go for, for the Cox Plate or, or the Everest. But but again, look, we understand the, the one thing we do is we don't take these things lightly. We don't we don't we don't plan on running in these races just to be a participant. We're not looking for a for a blue ribbon. You know, we're going there because we think that we can compete and we can bring home a victory and, and we know what it undertakes. I mean, if, for example, from America, if you go to America, Australia, uh, from America, you got to be there for 30 days. You got to train. The, the thing is on these international things is, look, everybody has things done differently. When we had Minor Biscuits and he was going to go stand stud in Japan, we talked about running in the Japan Cup and took it very, very seriously and, and, and met with them and tried everything out. And, and the thing is, in the Japan Cup, you know, things are done so differently over there. You know, you can't really bring anything with you. The horse had real sensitive skin. Um, there's You're in the paddock for an hour where in America you're in the paddock for 15 minutes. Uh, there's no pony that takes you to the post. There's nobody in the starting gate with you. So these are things that you need to know about. I remember the first year we ran in Saudi Arabia. I was actually, I was with uh, an ownership group, Jay Stables, and we had a filly named Bella Fever running in the uh, three-year-old race over there. And she was the, she was the post-time favorite. Uh, her name was Bella Fever. And she went with the hood um, the day before the race. The stewards informed us we weren't allowed to wear the hood. And sure enough, behind the gate, she flipped. Hmm. So if we knew we couldn't wear the hood in the first place, maybe we wouldn't have even traveled over there. Hmm. You know, you want to know the rules and you want to, you want to prepare your horses as best thing possible. Like here, for example, Saudi Dubai, it's a 20 minute walk to the track. So we do that here now at home with this horse, Maras, I did it with biscuits where you're practicing for what they're going to, yeah. they're going to see over there because yeah. it's, to me, it's so important. Horses are creatures of habit. Yeah. And so you want them to prepare for the trip as best they can. So when they get there, it's normal to them. Sometimes yeah. when horses just go and they're taken out of their environment, they're taken out of their element, they kind of have a tendency to fall apart and they can't handle it. And then it shows on race day. So yeah. we try and know the rules, learn the rules, and practice those rules kind of already ahead of time, month, two months out to prepare for this trip. And just the final question, you know, kid from Long Island makes good wins the goal in Shaheen, um, you know, back to back, um, first career victory, um, third, second in Breeders' Cup, massive races over there. What is, what's a big lesson you've learned over this time, you know, that's really going to put you in great stead going forward? So the biggest lesson you learn is that you never stop learning. Yeah. That's the, to me, that's the, 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 the number one thing. When you go and your first victory is in a $2 million race, you have a tendency to have an inflated ego and an inflated yeah. uh, mindset that I can do this with any horse. This is yeah. easy. This is my first horse. I'll, I'll be here, uh, you know, year in and year out. We'll be yeah. running in all these big races. And it's just not the case. You know, every horse is different. And sometimes you can have a horse who is just a $10,000 horse and you win a race with them. And, and you did the best job you could. And that's, that's his level. You know, no matter what you do, that's gonna be his goal. You can't you can't get them to 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 be a morass or to be a mind your biscuits. And I think that's what you learn is every day you're gonna learn something new. And every day, everything, every horse is different, every ad everything is different. You can't train and treat everything the same because everything will change and nothing will ever go your way. I mean, even here, we came down to Florida to break up this trip, so we left New York last Thursday. We figured we'll spend nine days down here and we'll go to Saudi Arabia. And as soon as we got down here, the tracks closed. Mm -hmm. So we've been training on this uh, L trail, which is like a half mile trail and had to completely change everything that we were going to do and how we were going to train and how we were going to prepare to make this trip. So you, you have to kind of just use pencil, not pen. That is awesome. This has been really cool, Chad. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Matt.
Of course. Cheers. And I hope to speak to you soon as well. Thank you.